have actually 15 minutes for this session, and I think I, I want to jump into the, the conversation. We have here uh, uh, here with me Ed and oops. <laughs> Uh, and Ryan. So Ed comes from the collective in London, actually the biggest uh, co-living space uh, in uh, in the world. And we have Ryan from Pure House Lab, um, that is a, a, like a collective of people and uh, people sharing knowledge around the co-living. And I think I will start with Ed. I'd love to, to hear our, our opinion about like where co-living is coming from and where it's heading. So what's your uh, take on it? Sure, thank you. Well, firstly, I'm really excited to be here and sat amongst two really talented people. Um, I mean, my view on it is that we're not doing anything too radical. Living with people is, is not that different from what we've been doing for tens of thousands of years. In fact, early modern humans came from, you know, sharing, sitting around camping fires, and that's how language developed. So I think, on one hand, we're trying to make it a lot easier to live with people. Um, we are also trying to solve a really big problem in cities, which is that finding somewhere to live is a notoriously crap experience. Um, so that's a big part of, of our focus. And I think for that reason, it's going to grow more and more. And I expect it will be a global phenomenon because this is not a problem that's exclusive to, to London. And Ryan, what is your take? Because you actually are in a very privileged position of working and uh, uh, hearing from so many different co-living spaces around the world. What's your take on it? What is, where is this coming from and where is it heading? Um, so I think there's three primary areas that it's coming from, and or drivers, that among which there are many other things. So r housing costs are astronomical in cities. Um, which means that people are living in illegal kind of shared situations or um, the quality of housing is just really poor. Uh, and then two, uh, a desire for more mobility and flexibility in lifestyle. And then three, a craving for community and connection. So I think that those are the drivers. Um, and um, I, I believe that this is going to be a primary sector of um, of real estate or of housing um, and right now it's primarily driven by millennials but uh, but it can be applied to any demographic I mean uh, uh, my friend Mike Zuckerman who's here is is applying this model to refugee camps so I mean you can you can only imagine it, it, it can go very far and wide and in London, basically, uh, something that's very interesting is like you told me before that the average age of someone living in a co uh, in your co-living space is 28 years old. Uh, so still in the Y uh, Y generation bracket, but like, but it's different from maybe maybe what people think about like the 20 something year olds living in together in like in a fraternity kind of space. What's your take on it? So it's are are you going to see? older and older people going to these kind of spaces? Uh, what's, what are you seeing? And I think with our building, certainly, we have 546 rooms, so it's a massive building, and that means we attract a huge range of people. Um, about 65 to 70% of our members are under the age of 30, but our oldest member is 70, for example, and our youngest is 18. Uh, the 18 year old has decided that he didn't want to go to university and he wanted to be part of something, a, a, I suppose, a different kind of education. And, and the 70 year old is, wants to feel part of a community. So for me, it, it's a mindset. I think naturally when people look at co-living, they think, oh, it's just student halls for adults. But, you know, I, I really challenge that in many respects. And I think that it's uh, quite a short sighted view if, if you think that. And, and our, the data we have so far is that it's definitely not um, ties to younger people. In fact, there is no correlation from the data that we have between your happiness in the co-living space and your age. So I think it will it'll be interesting to see what happens. Do you also have families or is it just like individual people? So we don't have families, no, but we have been approached many times uh, by developers who want to uh, build uh, spaces for families. We also have get approached all the time by people who want to build uh, retirement homes as well. So. What's your? Uh, are you seeing like families moving to uh, like these school living spaces? Uh, what's uh, what have you seen in this space? Um, well, I mean, I can speak most specifically to when we were experimenting with co-living um, in in Brooklyn. 
And we got a tremendous number of applications from young families, single mothers, senior citizens, um, and in many ways they were, I mean, it was an application process and they were, they were putting forth a very strong argument for why they wanted to live in this type of community with different people. Um, and, uh, and I think that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's only going to grow as we, as we provide more options for people um, for these, style, these styles of housing that people will fill into them. It's very interesting because uh, early this week I was looking at the Pure House uh, website and I, I checked your video and I was expecting to see young entrepreneurs with their sur surfboards coming out or like going to these spaces. But what I saw was like real people uh, living in these uh, in these uh, co-living spaces, uh, different age uh, groups. So uh, basically, what we are trying to do also with power, uh, powerhouses, like to make sure that people understand that co-living but once again is not for the millennials, only for the millennials, is for everyone. But what else are you doing in terms of like as a, a non-profit to empower, uh, I would say like co-living entrepreneurs um, uh, building the next, uh, the next spaces in the future? Sure. So, um, so we're broken into three parts uh, as an organization. So think, connect, and create. So think is primarily research. Connect is events and workshops that bring people together to learn together, uh, which feeds into the think bit. And then, uh, and then the create is primarily prototyping and helping to develop uh, different models for co-living. And then there are six different forums. So the first is community. The second is space, so architecture and design. Uh, third is model, organizational and business model. Fourth, very important piece often overlooked is policy, regulation, code, zoning. Um, and then, um, and then com uh, communication, so internal and external communications, and services and tools. I think I got all six, yeah. And what have been your main learnings around those topics? Because you mentioned like, so policy is something that people sometimes overlook, mm -hmm. but uh, what have been the main learnings? What have you seen the main trends also around like business models and uh, all, all around like communities, community building, what have been? Hmm. I don't know if I, I mean, if, if you ask the main trends of things that we're seeing, it's, it's that the business bottle piece is very hard to figure out, um, especially if not done at scale. And then on the other side, if done at scale, the community part's a big, a big challenge. So, um, so there's some real tensions uh, and, and challenges there. And fortunately, we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of, uh, solutions that are coming up from the community. So there's about 250 members of the network and I urge you all to, to please join, it's free. Um, and these, these members provide their experience and expertise that can be shared amongst the network um, to solve for some of these challenges. And so we're learning every day. What about you, Ed? Like, uh, you, uh, we, we were talking before and your, the story of the collective uh, is very different from probably what we are usually seeing uh, with other co-living uh, spaces or co-living houses. Uh, what have been your main learnings? And I also know that community is a big challenge for you, uh, do your, uh, your size. How are you coping with it? Where do I start with challenges? I mean, Brits are notoriously rubbish at sharing. Um, I mean, I do know for a fact the French are worse, but uh, it definitely makes it hard when you get given a building and you've got 546 rooms to fill. You've got investors who are saying, we want to see numbers, and, uh, and you still want to curate the community or at least give that sense of community in some way. And you, you can't just label you know, a co-living space as a community, it has to come from within. And so for us, that's been a, that's been a really big challenge. Um, I think Ron touched on it earlier, but the policy piece is a really difficult uh, one as well. We've been lobbying governments for years. Uh, we've, that when you apply for planning on a big, you know, 20 story tower, there is not a co-living consent uh, drop down box, unfortunately. So we've had to think outside the box every time and, um, mayors change and that often sets you back years. Uh, we finally, after four years, to put it into context, just got a building through planning last week in Stratford, but we bought the land in 2013 and it's taken till now. We've had to reduce the massing hugely, so it's gone halved in size, basically. So at this stage, it's so early on and, and local 
planners and, and governments are struggling to recognize that millennials and, and generally urbanites are settling down in different ways. So it's, it's about showing them that we can do it, that we can build a robust model and then get them on board. What have been like for you um, the most interesting stories out of this uh, uh, this experience? Because I, I imagine that a lot of people like the people are living together. Probably they are building things together. What have been the most interesting stories? It's a really good question. I mean, for me, and, and just to give a quick shout out to Ryan, and I think what Pure House has done so well is they've really created an extremely deep human experience um, where the space is the vehicle to achieve this kind of deep realization of, of what you can do, realizing your full potential and, you know, hats off to him and the team. It's, it's incredible what they've managed to do. Um, for us, we're getting there slowly. It takes a, a bit longer to do that at scale. But I've, I think for me, the greatest um, accomplishments are seeing how people have moved into this place. They've taken quite a risk to do it because it is quite unconventional. And then in doing it, they've realize like shit like i can do so much with my life if i take risks and they meet people they feel less lonely straight away because they're part of this much bigger community they're being educated by other people who've got unique skill sets and suddenly your life goes from being quite dull to now really exciting and you're off on a completely different tangent and that for me is is where co-living will go right do you have any like stories to share with us um that that can show the success of co-living um let's see Three marriages, um, tons of business ventures created between people living there, um, world excursions that people go on. A lot of the stuff that happened uh, at Pure House, um, I didn't even know happened. I mean, it came it came from the ground up. And even though I gave them tools to communicate, they oftentimes just organized amongst themselves. And it was incredible to experience the learnings, and that's why we started the lab and you know to, to research this further and to see how we could help other people and something that we are also seeing is that like more of these co-living spaces are, are getting an international uh, footprint so they are they start in london or other cities and then they start uh, spreading around what's the advantages of of having this uh, international uh, experience uh, in your point of view um i mean the the application is different in every environment and so to be able to have a network of of individuals that are very very passionate, you know, bubbling up in Taiwan or in Beijing or Singapore or Rio de Janeiro or you know the list goes on and on, um, you know, means that you know that local solutions are being developed and any of those individuals in those cities can help other people in other cities uh, address those those challenges. What about you? Because right now you're only focused on in London. Uh, do you have plans to, to expand internationally? What can we you gain from that expansion? So yeah, we're very focused on London, but um, top secret, we're expanding into Europe pretty soon and uh, hopefully the US as well. So we've got a team out in, uh, in America looking for sites. We, we design, build and operate these buildings. Um, and as Ryan says, each country is going to be different. For me, I think the biggest uh, advantage for our members will be the fact that they can have a home in another country. And um, you see companies like Rome Co-Living who've built this community around digital nomads. They've got six sites around the world. You know, for me, it's doing that at scale and somewhere where you can plug into a community and plug into a home, imagining a place where you can you know, you can leave London and then you can be in, in Sao Paulo and find your wardrobes there as well. Um, so that kind of, we call it in the collective, living as a service, kind of borrowing the principles of software as a service, but applying it to living. You know, I think that's, that's uh, one of the massive advantages that we'll see. Ryan, last question for you now. Uh, what is the big dream? Uh, so you, like, since you, you are building a platform and uh, a community around cool living, what is the big d dream for you? Like, and we talked before about where we are, we are going to see uh, the cool living in the next few years, but what's the big dream? Um, there, I mean, that's, that's a very long conversation. <laughs> um, <laughs> we only have but, two minutes. So. But uh, um, by point of reference to the last talk, uh, or to the last uh, moderated uh, panel, um, to have uh, or to foster a network of locations like the camp 
all around the world that can share knowledge and resources with one another. Um, but, you know, focused, um, you know, it's like that thinking, you know, thinking global, acting local, um, and, um, and then ultimately to be able to, um, to kind of move, move off the grid, so to speak, so play around with alternative forms of currency and exchange that are, you know, that are appreciative, appreciative versus built on scarcity models. So like one of the first talks that, that we heard around new ways of, of, of sharing resources with one another that is not restricted by scarcity. So thank you very much. I think what, what I see from this conversation and previous conversations that we had is like, is everything is up for building and for reimagine. And I think that's for every, anyone that wants to try this uh, uh, and go and join a co-living uh, house or wants actually to build a co-living house. I think that's like, it's a sandbox where you can do whatever you want because everything is up for uh, building and rebuilding. And, uh, and that's, I think, is very exciting. So thank you very much for being here with us. Thank so you. I hope that you deal well with the warm weather in the, of, of the next few days. Mm -hmm. And uh, feel free to talk with uh, Ryan and Ed in the next few days because they will be here and uh, happy and to And our talk. website, it's purehouselab.org if you're interested in becoming a member. So oh, and we also, have, uh, we also have a co-living lounge and, uh, and we have lots of fun ways for you to interact with it and, and comment about your interest in, in living in this way. So please come and check us out. Thank you very much. Thank you.